Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody to Coach Yersich's uh, welcome press conference. We'll, uh, we'll start with Bob Flounders um, from Penn Live, and then we'll go to Mike Gross. So give me one second, Bob, and I will find you. There you go, Bob. Fire away. Hi, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Bob. Uh, thanks for doing this, Mike. Uh, I wanted to ask you two questions that are pretty much related. Um, could you a little bit? Could you talk a little bit about your offensive philosophy, Mike, and kind of who helped shape it? I know that you've been a, a bunch of places, and also James Franklin uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, the offense that he wants to see at Penn State. He mentioned a couple things. One of them, he's, he mentioned he wants to get back to an offense that uses tempo. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak to the value of tempo and the impact it has on your offenses maybe, and also the stress it puts on defenses. Okay, and so if I get sidetracked, just keep me on track with that three-pointed question. <laughs> uh, so influences, no, it's fine, it's a great question. Uh, influences uh, on me, you know, I think every coach that I've worked for has had an impact on me um, throughout the years. Um, I started off, I think, um, in a really good situation. One that allowed me to get my hands dirty right off the bat and really get my hands in the mix, so to speak, and, and start coaching at an early age with my first boss, Kevin Donnelly, who was back in the day, was run and shoot and very aggressive on offense, a lot through the air. And then I got a, a really good um, development as a young GA at Indiana University with two guys. Um, Al Borges was the first offensive coordinator I worked for, who was well versed in the West Coast offense, and Steve Adazio, who then took over the second year. And I really got a good experience from both of those guys, a wealth of knowledge and really worked really hard on, on trying to learn those fundamentals and the systems for those two seasons. From there, I went to Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, Division II school. I spent six years at Edinburgh and was coordinator for five of those years, coached quarterbacks all six years. Uh, Lou Tepper was the head coach there my first year. Um, learned a lot from Lou, very detailed, organized coach. And then Scott Browning took over, learned a lot from Scott as well. From there, I went to Shippensburg, uh, coached for Mark Macheski, awesome guy, great leader, and learned a lot from him from a structural standpoint. And um, a lot of the things I do today throughout my day, uh, I, I did back, back then at, at Shippensburg as well. And then from there, obviously, went to uh, – Oklahoma State, Mike Gundy had a big impact on me um, as a head coach, uh, offensive mind, a spread guy, aggressive coach in his own right, had a big impact on me. And then to Ohio State with Ryan Day and Kevin Wilson, both, you know, all, anybody you work for, there, there's going to be influences and people that you're going to learn from. And then lastly, coaching with Coach Herman and now here at Penn State, uh, you, you just continue to learn from not just the head coaches, but also the assistants. You know, when we go around, we recruit and we talk about the quarterbacks that we've been able to coach, how fortunate I've been in my career. You also, those aren't just not just in the belt or, you know, resume builders. You're also learning from those elite quarterbacks, learning a lot because once you play a certain amount, whether it's high school and then into college ranks, those quarterbacks get very smart. They are very smart. They understand the game very well. So you're also learning from quarterbacks as well. I think a lot of times as coaches and people that perceive coaches, you're always thinking that it's input coming out. Um, I, I like to think that I receive a lot of input, especially from great quarterbacks that I've been so lucky and fortunate to coach. Um, so the next question was, uh, I don't know, was it tempo now? Tempo. Yeah, so tempo. You know, tempo has been um, something that's, that's really helped us as an offense. And when you're dealing with trying to run an offense that has tempo in it, the question that you asked was why tempo? What, what does it do for you? And it can harm you if you're not careful and don't know what you're doing. But the things that are good about tempo are you try to minimize the amount of communication that the defense can have in between snaps because there's plenty of that based on your alignments, based on where the back is, based on 
whether it's three by one based on where the ball is in the middle of the field. So you're trying to really handcuff them into minimizing how much information they can communicate in between each place from position to position. You know, they got to get their strength. They got to get their call. And so you're trying to minimize that. You're trying to exhaust them. Okay. You're trying to wear them out and, and get them huffing and puffing. And, and uh, so it's, it's an equalizer. It tries to, it, it just, you exhaust and you, and you eliminate communication. Those are the two main goals. Try to wear them out. Mike Gross, Lancaster Newspapers, and then we'll go to Partha Padre. Hi, Mike. Thanks for doing this. You're welcome, Mike. Thank you. Um, those of us who cover the team, if, if you asked us to describe Joe's offense in a couple of sentences, we could all we could all do it. Like spread, no huddle, check with me stuff, RPO, et cetera. How would you, in, in a sort of shorthand way, describe the features that make your that make it distinctly a, a, a Mike Yurchik offense? Uh, yes. Um, so it's not going to be a Mike Yurcich offense. It's going to be a Penn State offense. Um, it's going to be an offense. There's there's three keys to it, really. Um, traits, if you will. One, physical. We want to be a physical offense. Two, we want to be a smart offense. Three, we want to be a skilled offense. We're going to be a talented offense, obviously, from the players that we're able to recruit here at Penn State. But we want to be tar uh, smart, uh, <laughs> tough, smart, and skilled. Tough, smart, and skilled. And so when we line up, the most important thing is our players, how we line them up in formations, and how we get them matched up. And lastly, it's plays. So players, formations, and plays. And, uh, you know, that's been the key to our success, having a physical mindset, and there's, there's, you know, the game hasn't changed in over 120 years or however long it's been playing. It's still one up front. We got to be physical up front. We've got to do a great job recruiting up front. And then we have to put speed on the field, playmakers. We got to have a guy behind the, the center that can make decisions and be accurate with the, the football. Um, what kind of, you know, quarterback is that? We've, we've won with all kinds, guys that can uh, run it a little bit better than, than some, but the most important thing is we have to be able to throw it accurately. We have to be smart. We have to be tough. We have to be good leaders at that position. And we have to surround them with really good playmakers, guys that can make plays in space. Parthu Padre, uh, Center Daily Times. Ben Jones, you're next. Hey, Mike, appreciate the time. Um, I want to ask you something about uh, the quarterbacks. You touched on it a little bit earlier. You know, it seems like kind of everywhere you've been, you've been able to kind of mold these elite quarterbacks, whether it's, you know, Mason Rudolph at Oklahoma State, Justin Fields at Ohio State, or even, you know, Sam Ellinger last year. Uh, with kind of the struggles that, you know, Penn State's quarterback room had last season, uh, what gives you confidence that you can kind of continue, you know, your uh, path of success here with the quarterbacks? Well, it's always a challenge, and you never want to think that you figured it out. So I take a humble approach, I'd like to think, into each job. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I think – we have to understand a couple different things at that position. What's really important is that our eyes have to be right and our feet have to be right. And if you have those two things going for you on each play, then you, you give yourself a chance for success. So I don't know what happened in the past and I'm not here to judge that right, wrong or indifferent, but what we'll do moving forward is make sure that the quarterbacks, his eyes are right. He knows where he's looking, where he needs to be looking and wherever we tell him based on whatever particular scheme that we're running. So his focal point and his eyes are disciplined and he's always steady with how he progresses through his, his progressions, how he moves through his progressions. And nextly is his feet. He's got to have a good platform. He's got to transfer his weight. Those are things that we can control where our eyes are, our eye discipline and our feet discipline. And then on top of that, you know, it's about the, the individual's accuracy and, and their talent level. Ben Jones, statecollege.com, and then we'll go to Audrey Snyder. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Thanks for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, when you were at Oklahoma State, you guys kind of had middle-of-the-road recruiting classes, I would say, in terms of national rankings and all that jazz. Um, but you were able to have a lot of success moving the ball and a lot of success scoring the ball. What do you think the key is to getting the most out of the personnel that you have, regardless of what other people might sort of summarize them as? I think you have to do what your personnel can do. You know, you, you can't try to fit a, 
a square peg in a round hole. So you got to make sure that you're you're asking your quarterback to do things that are within his skill set, and the same thing with every other position out there. Now there there there's certainly comes a time where you're trying to make sure that the personnel you're recruiting fit into your system, but your system has to be adaptable to the talent level. Now you could say that the recruiting classes were average, um, but there were significant parts of that offense that were not average. I would not consider Mason Rudolph, Justice Hill, or James Washington, mm -hmm. or you know, I can keep going on with the amount of talent that we had at certain spots that really made us over the top good on offense. Because again, it, it really is about the players. It's about your personnel. It's about recruiting. That's a big part of it. I'm not trying to undervalue the amount of scheme or uh, how, what coaching, you know, how much that involves, but uh, it's important to get the players. Uh, there's no question about it. And we have good players here at Penn State and I'm excited to get to work with them. Audrey Snyder from The Athletic, and then we'll go to Dennis Dodd. Hey, Mike, uh, two-part question. I wanted to ask if this uh, past interview was the first time you'd formally interviewed with Coach Franklin, um, and what have you seen so far from Sean Clifford, um, and do you believe he you know, has the tools to be a starter here for you? Yeah, uh, Coach Franklin and I um, have had several discussions over the years that have taken its course over a long period of time, several years. And with our backgrounds in the PSAC going all the way back to, to our playing days, uh, we've crossed paths many times. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions over the years. But my, my comments on any individual player, my opinions of them, I'm not gonna give them, whether it's on Sean or anybody up front or any receivers right now, I think it's best for me to approach this, uh, you know, very non-judgmental, especially with media, I, I think it's fair for me to go through spring practice and then give you an assessment of where those guys are at at that time. I don't wanna prejudge or, or talk about uh, any one player uh, specifically with you guys at this point. Dennis Dodd, CBS Sports, uh, and then Mark Brennan, you're on deck. Hey Mike, thanks for doing this. Um, from, from an offensive standpoint or from a defensive standpoint, these defenses as a whole aren't gonna stand still for the spread and, and what it has you know, been over these last few years. How much do you self scout just to try to stay ahead of the curve uh, with defenses trying to crack the code on the spread? Yeah, you, you gotta do a bunch of it. It's gotta be weekly, Dennis. Um, self scouting has gotta be something that's within your, you know, we have scouting reports every week that come out, but our, our young GAs and analysts will also provide us information on the self scout as well. So it's very important that we uh, are aware of our tendencies and each week try to break those and complement whatever it is that we're showing to the defense. We have to be very aware of that. And so you're right on. I mean, the, the, you know, the most important thing about an offense or one of the most important things about an offense is that you're complementary. So whatever it is that you're showing and have a tendency towards doing you have to be able to anticipate what the defense is going to do and then be able to attack that adjustment. So you have to anticipate things coming down the road at you from a schematic standpoint. A lot of that um, is uncovered through your self-scouting uh, reports. Mark Brennan, Fight On State, and then we will go to Mike Persak. Hey, Mike, uh, welcome to State College, and I hope you're enjoying the northern weather again. Oh, yeah. Feels great, man. Hey, I understand you don't want to talk about individual players and their talents and whatnot, but can you speak to the importance of getting Christian Valu in as an early en enrollee, given where you guys are with the transfer portal, and then the importance of this spring practice overall for, for him and all the quarterbacks? Yeah, I think for any new quarterback coming in, it's nearly impossible to play as, as a, a freshman without an, an, an experience in that first spring of an early enrollee, which Christian will have. So it gives them a chance. Um, it'd be very hard uh, to be a backup or even to be able to contribute as an early guy coming in without that first spring. So for him to come in early, it gives him a really good chance to get a leg up and to, to learn the offense and to be well-versed, to give him a chance to compete in the fall for the position of being a backup or, or being able to make sure that uh, he's you know maybe one snap away and can be – you know, a really good contributor for us or maybe being the guy. So it's uh, it's critical that guys come in early nowadays and uh, are early enrollees. It just helps the process 
especially when you're in a situation like we are with only three scholarship quarterbacks. And I'm not sure I, I, I heard the second part of your question there. Uh, let me pull them back up. Go ahead. I'm now. sorry. It was just the importance of spring practice uh, for your quarterbacks in general with a new system. We saw last year Penn State didn't have a spring practice, and I think James said that was very difficult. Thank yeah, you. it was difficult on all of us. You know, we didn't have one at Texas last year either. And, and uh, you know, there's everybody was kind of in the same boat. Um, it's just a matter of reps. And I've said it before. It's like it's like anything that you're trying to get good at in a, in a skill level, whether it's playing the piano or it's playing quarterback, the amount of reps that you have at it, you're going to you're going to naturally improve with the, the amount of time on task. You know, so I don't know how many reps that is uh, over 200 reps say in team and seven on seven, you can't get that back. There's no way you can make up for it because if you're, if you try to make up for it on the other end, you know, the receivers, there's only so many reps to go around because of, you know, recovery and, and what you're trying to do and, and save legs and make sure they got guys are fresh and you don't want to put anybody at injury uh, at risk for injury. So the reps are very precious and they're, they're few and far between and you have to maximize each rep that you get, uh, whether it's a mental rep in a meeting and which we've learned are so vital nowadays, especially in the day of Zoom, being able to meet virtually, how important it is for the from the mental side all the way to the physical to physical rep of it. Mike Persak, uh, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Donnie Collins. Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, I'm curious what what the acclimation process has been like for you in terms of. Um, you know, getting familiar with the players. Have you got already gotten into like past film? Are you waiting for spring practice to get like sort of, um, you know, first impressions from the guys? How do, you, how do you go about doing that? Yes, sir. So great question. The first thing you want to do is, is really get involved with what we're going to run and make sure all the coaches are set and we're organized from a coaching staff standpoint. I know these players are chomping at the bit to, to learn our schemes and, and we're, uh, starting to meet with the players to install our schemes, but we want to make sure that we've got all of our T's crossed and I's dotted and, and we're organized as a staff. And that just takes a lot of hours and a lot of communication, a lot of meetings. So for the first two weeks on a job, it's been a lot of staff meetings daily. And on top of that, you're trying to recruit your butt off and stay on top of that. So it's been a, a juggle between installation and and the recruiting aspect of it. And then you're trying to get to know your players at, at the same time. So there's been a lot of communication and uh, a lot of meetings and it's been a, a bunch of fun. You're great people here. And and if you if this is what you love to do, so it, it hasn't been one day of work yet. So it's been fun. Go to Donnie Collins, Scranton Times Tribune, and then we'll go to Rich Scarcella. Hi, Mike, thanks for doing this. Um, your, your relationship with James, how far exactly does that go back? Did you, did you play against him in, in college? And, and what, what do you remember about the early days when you, when you were first getting to know him? And, and how has that relationship kind of lasted through the years? I, I can't remember the, the first time we had contact. I really can't several years ago. Um, but I did not play against him. We did not play East Strasburg when I was at California, Pennsylvania. So I didn't get the pleasure of lining up against him. But I think he was graduated. Anyway, by the time I got to, to Cal PA, but uh, no, um, just the relationship has grown over the years. Uh, you know, like minds um, talk a lot of football and and see a lot of things the same way with regards to, to the philosophy of football and coaching. And uh, I think, you know, from from my standpoint, admiring what he's done, his body of work, very impressive. And uh, obviously, you know, in this business, uh, try to get to know rising stars and superstars in this profession is what you try to do. And, and um, you know, just obviously networking is a big part of it. Um, and I think there's a mutual respect there. And the most important thing is with that relationship is that we see things eye to eye and there's a, a you know, a parallel kind of vision as far as offensive philosophy goes. Rich Scarcella, Reading Eagle, and then we'll go to T Frank. Hi, Mike. Thanks for doing this. Um, two questions about your track record. One, why are downfield plays such a big part of what you've been running and, and, and why are they important to you? And secondly, uh, in an ideal world, um, is 
design are design runs by the quarterback a big part of what you've done over the years? Um, first part, explosions are huge in, in this day and age as far as what correlates to wins. So three things we really look at, Rich. One, turnovers, minimizing the turnovers, winning the turnover battle, always giving the defense a long field, especially our defense here at Penn State. If we can give them a long field every time and never give them a short field, take care of the football, always end the series in whether you're kicking a field goal or you're punting, and we just take care of that football, that's a big part of what we'll do um, from a philosophy and emphasis standpoint, ball security. Second thing is scoring. Get the ball in the end zone. Score. When you're in the red zone, you've got to come away with points. you got to come away with touchdowns. So scoring. And then explosives are the other part that we feel is very, very important and correlates to wins. Being explosive, scoring, and uh, li limiting uh, turnovers. Those are the three things that are, that are most important from an explosion standpoint, statistically speaking. You asked me about quarterback runs. It all depends on, on you know, your, your quarterback and, and really your depth at quarterback as well. You know, that factors in. Um, we saw in the playoffs, the Chiefs run speed option and, you know, Mahomes gets concussed and luckily he got to come back that next week, but it makes you think twice about running speed option, right? So those are all the things that you have to consider. You have to weigh. Um, you know, the risk versus the benefit. Because whenever you're running the quarterback, you're, you're equating numbers, right? It's, it's 11 on 11 when the quarterback runs it. When you hand it off, right, now they have 11 to tackle your 10. So it's, it's a simple math game. And obviously you have an advantage whenever you're running the quarterback or any type of option. So that's, that's the game we play uh, as coaches trying to contemplate, you know, the risk and reward of running the quarterback. Thomas Francari, ESPN Radio, 1450, and then we'll go to Neil Rudell. Mike, good to meet you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask you about those explosive plays you talked about. Uh, two of the last three years, your quarterbacks under your tutelage have been in the top 20 when it comes to, excuse me, the uh, overall number of completions over the middle when it comes to intermediate and deep passes. Is that by design, and is that a part of something that you believe in when it comes to getting the ball down the field uh, for your, your pass offense? I think any good pass offense has a multitude of ways to hit in breaking routes. I mean, there's a time to throw the ball outside because that's what most defenses give you is the outside throw, especially to the field because the hashes are so much wider than the NFL. So it's harder to hit that uh, perimeter throws to the outside to the field. Um, however, it, it can't be all one thing, but I think uh, your high percentage routes break in. And um, I don't think there's any particular goal other than trying to find the one on one and trying to, you know, throw the ball for as many yards per completion as we can throw and still trying to get that high percentage, you know, completion rate. You know, that's the goal. We can be 70%, but if our yards per completion or around five to six yards, you know, we'd like to see that number, you know, it's all give and take with that, but uh, higher percentage in breaking routes. And there's a time to take it outside, obviously, but then your percentages will go down. Neil Rudell, Altoona Mirror, and then we'll go to Joe Giuliano. Hey, Mike, uh, welcome. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> just wondering, uh, I got on when Bob was asking this question, Chris, was Bob first? Yes, he was. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't want to disappoint anybody. You said the game's won up front. How do you feel about quarterback going under center, uh, fullback use, uh, power football? It's, it's great. I, I, I love power football. Um, it's how I was raised. Um, there's a time to go under center. I think it provides a lot of advantages. When you can turn your back to the defense, they don't know where the ball is necessarily. So I think your play action passes can increase. I think that you can sustain a longer suck on the defense on play action pass because you're now taking a five step drop instead of a flash fake out of the gun. So I think that um, playing under center has a tremendous amount of advantages depending on what your schemes are. Playing with a fullback, you know, whether we call them a tight end or fullback, it, 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 you're trying to insert a lot of times and create that extra gap 
And when he's in the backfield, you're able to insert a multitude of gaps so they don't know exactly where it's going to fit. So that fullback position does give you uh, good angles, leverage, and it allows you know you to complement yourselves based on whether you're running a power or maybe you want, want to come back and run uh, the gap scheme the other way on a counter look. So the, the fullback does have its advantages and, and obviously in the play action pass. What people have got away from is, you know, recruiting that type of body because most people now play with a multitude of tight ends and they're all above six, four, you know, six, five. And so we're trying to get a lot done with those tight ends and inserting those guys into the line of scrimmage and trying to create extra gaps um, with a longer athlete that can also flex out and be a wide receiver and give you versatility uh, with regard to 12 or maybe even 13 personnel. So to me, uh, muscling up formations doesn't necessarily need to be with a fullback, but I think you can do it out of multiple tight end sets and get a lot done uh, with, with, with that as well. Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia, whoop, Philadelphia Inquirer, and then we'll have Corey Geiger. We are probably looking at two more questions for coach here. Hi, Mike. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Joe. Um, Penn State was dreadful in the red zone this past season, barely 50% uh, touchdown conversions. Uh, what's your secret to uh, good red zone play? Well, if you look at red zone scoring, the types of offenses that are the highest are what type of offenses? Triple option. Triple option. Army, Navies, all those guys, Georgia Techs, they're all going to be the highest scoring in the red zone year in and year out. So it goes right back to, was it Neil's question or no, Rich's question, I can't remember, I'm sorry, of how much to run the quarterback, you know? So how many hits do you want him to take? And then we, you know, we got to play the next guy. So you have to weigh those options of whether, how much we're going to run the quarterback and how much we're going to hand it to the tailback. And then, you know, we get the questions after the game, why the tailback only touch it so many times and, you know, all that fun stuff, right? And so it's, it's and when you get in the red zone, they have less space to defend. So there's more people in the box. So it's harder to run the football. And that's where quarterback runs, runs uh, give you the best advantage of, of scoring points down there. Uh, you also have to be very efficient in your play action pass down there. And then it's all about body types. It's about matchups down there. That's, to me, what makes good red zone offenses, good red zone offenses, is you're asking your players to do what they do best and you're trying to set them up uh, in the best matchup that you possibly can get, however you're formation them. Um, I think it's important to identify uh, what coverage they're in, maybe man or zone, and try to get yourself into the best play that you possibly can be in. I think those things help you um, in, in the red zone coming away with points. Our last question today will go to Corey Geiger, Nittany Sports Now. Hey, good afternoon, Mike. Uh, can you tell us any differences you've noticed from the things that you do with Big Ten defenses versus Big 12 defenses? Uh, you know, I think, I think it's kind of it, – without going into too many, uh, you know, football talk or, or jargon, I mean, they're either going to play too high and you're going to try to run the football or they're going to play one high and they got too many guys and you're either going to have to run option or you're going to have to throw the ball. And then sometimes you're going to say to heck with it, we're going to run on the extra guy and either make a miss or run through them. And there's a time for that too. But basically it's the same thing. There's eight gaps. You got to try to fit all eight gaps. Um, you know, if they're playing two safeties high or down the gap, run the ball. Um, there's a lot of carryover on a conference to conference. Um, defense to defense. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, are multiple in the fact that they can play three down and four down and be able to interchange throughout the game of what front they're giving you. So it, it, it makes you communicate all that much more and it makes your job more difficult from a run fit standpoint, from your blocking rules, all the way to your protections. And so the game really hasn't changed. I mean, it's a little bit different, but there's only two coverages you, you can play. It's either man or it's zone. It's either one high or two high. Coach, thank you very much for your time today and appreciate everybody joining us. Um, thanks, everybody, and we'll have the video out later this afternoon. Thanks, all.